Well, I'd like to welcome you to the first 1811 Society Symposium virtual event. Uh, we've been doing a number of these as a result of uh, you know, COVID-19. And thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping items to begin with. The first, uh, in order to participate, you don't need a, 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 a microphone. You don't need a, a, a camera. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you should see something that says Q and A. Uh, by clicking on that, you can type in a question. And uh, after uh, Dr. Slavin and Dr. Jacobson have both given their uh, remarks, uh, as usual, we'll have a, a question and answer session, and both of them will be available uh, uh, to, uh, to answer those questions. Uh, for those of you who uh, are comfortable attaching your name to the question, if it turns out that we don't get to all the questions uh, by the uh, uh, end of the program, we will follow up with you individually. And, uh, and also, uh, I wanted to let you know that this uh, program is being recorded and will be made available uh, uh, to you. So uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Britt Nicholson. I'm the Senior Vice President for Development here at the hospital. And uh, again, I hope you and your family are healthy uh, during these uh, really challenging times. And we understand that virtually everybody has been personally affected in some way as a result of this pandemic. Uh, the program tonight is Understanding Loved Ones Facing Serious Illness in a Pandemic and How Can You Help? Uh, and uh, 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 our audience tonight includes not only members of the 1811 Society, but we're joined by supporters of the Emergency Response Fund and that fund was created after the 2013 marathon bombings. Uh, it's a flexible fund designed to increase the hospital's ability to rapidly respond to devastating events, uh, including this one, COVID-19 pandemic. Many of you uh, have supported our efforts to fight COVID-19. Uh, and just a few numbers, uh, to date we've received over 6,600 gifts from 37 states, 25 countries uh, for a total of more than $27 million. And uh, some of that's been directed uh, uh, specifically for research activities, but more than $15.8 million went in for the discretionary emergency to response fund to be spent by leadership at the hospital as they identify areas of uh, you know, greatest, uh, uh, you know, greatest, greatest need. Um, each of you, Participating tonight has helped us to provide the very best possible care, uh, protect those on the front lines, uh, advance research needed to help us move forward, and just as importantly, supporting uh, communities in need. You know, I'm often asked what makes Mass General special, and uh, I have many answers, uh, which include our commitment to compassionate care, especially during challenging times, uh, which is tonight's featured topic. However, I'd have to say that leadership uh, really ranks right at the top of the list. And Mass General is fortunate to have Dr. Peter Slavin as its president. I've known Peter for more than 30 years and I'm proud to call him a friend, uh, a colleague, uh, and a mentor. Peter spent most of his career at Mass General and uh, in 2003, he became president. And for the past 17 years, he's been a superb leader of a team that I feel is actually the best on the planet. The fact that Peter is so often chosen as a guest expert on national media speaks volumes about his leadership, but also about Mass General's important role in tackling this crisis. Early on, Peter called for the federal government and the private sector to increase production of vital supplies to keep frontline workers and patients safe. We continue to make progress and I'm optimistic about our future. So Peter, thank you for continuing to lead the way in redefining medicine, not only from COVID-19, but for cancer, heart and brain disease, diabetes and beyond. In the 42 years that I've been at Mass General, I have never been prouder. Thanks again to all of you for support of the MGH Fund and the Emergency Response Fund. We will get through this together. Thank you very much, uh, Britt, and, uh, and thank you all so much for, uh, for joining us this evening. Um, 
I want to uh, echo what uh, Britt said earlier that we are, uh, we hope all of you are well, that your families are well, and, and that you uh, stay well in the coming, coming months. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, our staff, 27,000 uh, strong, who've really risen to the occasion over the last uh, few months as they have over the more than 200 year history of this hospital. But I also want to thank uh, all of you our, uh, our donors for your interest in the hospital, for your support of us. Uh, the, us. the external support we've got during the last few months has meant so much to me, so much to the entire staff, and, and we are so, uh, so grateful uh, for it. Uh, I just wanted to mention a few of the people and things that our staff has been doing, uh, just to give you a feel for uh, some of the heroic work that's been going on. Uh, I, I would start with our incident command leadership, which we activated back in January. This is almost like a military management structure that we put in place, led by Ann Prestipino, along with Paul Bittinger and, and Erica Chinoy, and they've just done a remarkable job turning the hospital inside out to respond to this uh, pandemic. But it doesn't, it far from ends there. We've had carpenters, environmental services uh, staff, converted spaces within the hospital, in record time to meet the needs of patients suffering from COVID. Our nutrition, security, cleaning crews have uh, been working tirelessly to make sure that the hospital is as clean as possible and our staff as well fed as possible. Chaplain social work and palliative care, we will be hearing from one of the leaders of palliative care later in the program, have also been very helpful to uh, supporting our staff through this uh, challenging time. But the, our, our work hasn't, uh, ended or not been limited to within the walls of the hospital. We've had our community health workers, people at our health centers uh, actively engaged in communities like Chelsea Revere and East Boston, trying to stem the tide of this disease in those uh, uh, un, uh, vulnerable uh, populations. Um, we also uh, are very grateful to the large number of patients who've turned to us for their care during this time. We've cared for more patients with COVID than any other hospital in the region. And we are also uh, grateful to their loved ones and feel badly for their loved ones who've been unable to uh, visit uh, their, lo their loved one in, in the hospital. That's been very difficult for our patients, very difficult for families, and, uh, and honestly, extremely difficult for our staff as well. But it's really a team sport, and that team that I've mentioned, and there are many more members of our staff that have uh, contributed it wouldn't have been possible without the support of uh, people like those on this uh, Zoom meeting. The uh, personal protective equipment that's been donated to the hospital, the food that's been donated to the hospital to feed our staff, and the philanthropic support that Britt mentioned has, has really been uh, in very inspiring and really helped uh, keep our staff's uh, chin up during this uh, challenging time. So I'd wanna thank the uh, members of the 1811 Society for the, standing by the hospital during this uh, challenging time, and also those who've contributed to our emergency response uh, fund. Uh, I think it's fair to say that over the course of our history, our supporters have always uh, stood us during good times and during challenging times, and, and we are just so grateful uh, for that. Um, this um, challenge that we face over the last few months is not a whole lot different than challenges that this hospital has faced in the past. We are, uh, have a longstanding history of commitment and expertise in emergency preparedness. And after the Ebola scare, we also were designated by the federal government as a regional, one of two regional centers for uh, preparedness for uh, un, uh, unusual pathogens. So this uh, really played into our uh, expertise. Um, and, uh, and as you know, this is not the first crisis, public health crisis that this hospital has responded to. If you go back in history, we responded to the horrible fire in Halifax Harbor for 100 years ago, the 1917 Spanish flu, Coconut Grove fire, Station nightclub uh, fire, and, uh, and obviously the Boston Marathon bombing uh, as well. So uh, our hospital has a deep history of uh, responding to health crises like this, this be it natural or, or man-made. And I guess one way to say it is that this hospital and it's called one of, I think one of the most inspiring aspects of the hospital and its culture is that when there's a fire, we tend to head into it, not run away from it. Um, as I said, uh, we, this uh, lesson, this 
crisis has really pointed out the incredible connection that exists between the social determinants of health that affect uh, some communities more than others and health care. Early on in this uh, crisis, we noticed that um, whereas normally 10% of our inpatients at Mass General are Spanish speaking, that 40% of those coming to us with COVID were Spanish speaking, we quickly checked the zip codes of those uh, patients and saw that a number of them were coming from uh, the communities in our backyard that we have a close relationship with, namely Chelsea, East Boston, and Revere. So we almost immediately began, began working with the leaders of those uh, communities to see how we could help. Uh, and in, I'll use Chelsea as, in, as an example. We have helped the city of Chelsea stand up a hotel for uh, patients needing to be quarantined from their families and are, have been providing all the medical and uh, nursing care in that hotel at no cost. Uh, we have uh, dramatically increased the amount of testing that is available at our Chelsea Health Center. Uh, we have um, been very heavily involved in food distribution within the city of Chelsea. And every time we distribute food, about 4,000 people uh, show up. It's truly uh, heartbreaking and heartwarming at the same time. And last but not least, we put together uh, care kits uh, from our own inventories uh, that included uh, uh, bilingual medical information about uh, avoiding caring for people with uh, COVID-19. It also included surgical masks, uh, hand hygiene, some other supplies, because we wanted to get these needed supplies into the hands of the residents of Chelsea and, uh, and make sure that they had the information and supplies they needed to prevent themselves from getting the disease. So those were distributed to every household in that uh, community. Uh, Thanks to the generosity of uh, many of our donors, uh, we were also able to establish a grant fund across our health system. Uh, that grant fund was made available to anyone within our organization making less than $55,000 a year and facing financial hardship due to a spouse losing a job or some other uh, financial uh, difficulty. Over 9,000 people across our organization have a, applied for that. Those $1,000 uh, grants, and, uh, and we are very pleased that, uh, again, through the generosity of the donors at Mass General and the Brigham and Women's Hospital, that we've been able to meet those, uh, those needs. Uh, this has not only been a clinical battle against this virus, it has also been a research battle. This virus has really, again, played into the research strength that we bring to bear in immunology and uh, clinical trials. We have a clinical trials uh, group that has been uh, screening all the potential trials that we could engage in and identifying the ones that are most promising. We we're actually involved in the randomized trial of remdesivir that led to its approval by the FDA a couple of uh, weeks ago. Uh, but we're also working more broadly across the community. Uh, Bruce, Reagan, Bruce uh, Walker, who's the director of our Reagan Institute, is uh, co-leading what's called the Mass CPR, the Massachusetts Cons Consortium for Pathogen Readiness which has brought together more than 100 investigators from MGH, the other hospitals, Harvard, MIT, Boston University, industry, and, and we have some of our most pro capable scientists working on diagnostics, vaccines, uh, therapeutics for this disease. That uh, consortium literally sprung up overnight and again was, has been made possible through uh, philanthropy. Um, we also have established an MGH uh, Brigham Center for COVID innovation. This has been extremely helpful to us as we've looked for ways to produce a PPE, reuse it, uh, develop, create new ventilators. So all sorts of innovative ideas that arose within the organization or came from the outside have been uh, triaged to this uh, innovation center and they've quickly evaluated them and, and their recommendations have had real impact, including the uh, hydrogen peroxide gas decontamination center that we um, have, uh, have, have up and running in Somerville and is uh, enabling us to use, reuse thousands of uh, N95 respirators uh, per, per week. There are, uh, there's obviously a lot of sadness, tragedy caused by uh, COVID-19, but there are also some silver linings in, in all of this. One of them that I would point to that I think is gonna change medicine dramatically in the future is the uptake of telemedicine that's occurred within the last few weeks. Uh, if you turn back the clock to February, less than 1% of our outpatient care 
was being delivered via telemedicine. Uh, sitting here today, that number is now at 85%. There has been just an incredible uptake of telemedicine by both our patients and our doctors. And I think the feedback that I've gotten from both groups has been incredibly positive. It's more convenient, a lot can be done uh, remotely. And, uh, and so I expect that telemedicine will be an important part of our uh, activities uh, going, going forward. Um, I also just wanted to give you a sense as to what's happening at the hospital right now. Uh, if, if we were to have this meeting three weeks ago, we would have had it at the peak of the number of patients that we had in the hospital, which uh, peaked at about 400 suffering from COVID-19. That's about 40% of our inpatient beds. Fortunately, those numbers have come down dramatically since then. As of uh, this morning, we have a total of 148 patients with COVID-19 in the hospital, 64 of whom are in the intensive care unit. Those are still extraordinary numbers, but fortunately, they continue to get uh, better uh, and lower every, every day. Um, so I, I hope you get a sense from my remarks and what from you've seen in the press and from our publications that this has been an all out uh, war by, uh, initiated by Mass General against this horrible uh, virus. It's not only been a war waged on our clinical, along our clinical mission, but our other missions as well, uh, community health, research, uh, and education as, uh, as well. I think the people of uh, the MGH have really responded uh, nobly to this uh, challenge. They are, uh, in, I, feel, I think, feel honored to uh, participate, play an important role in the crisis of our lifetimes. I think they are also at this point exhausted by what they've been through. I think they continue to be fearful of uh, contracting uh, COVID-19, but it does appear from the numbers that we walk, follow very carefully every day that the PPE that we provided our staff has been working and has been protecting them from contracting this disease. So I've been at this hospital associated with it for 35 years. I've always been proud to be a part of it, but I, as like Britt, I've never been more proud than over the last uh, few months to see the, um, to, to see the staff of the MGH just respond in such an amazing way. Their expertise, their dedication, commitment to our patients, their ability to innovate, their flexibility, their determination. It's just been awe-inspiring, and, uh, and I'll remember this for, for the rest of my, my life. So, and I want to thank you for being important parts of this uh, team. Uh, it really has always meant a lot to us to have uh, volunteers, uh, donors uh, who, support, who are interested and support our efforts, but it's never been more meaningful or valuable to us than uh, dur during recent times. So we are incredibly grateful. Uh, so I want to uh, turn this uh, Zoom meeting over to Dr. Juliet Jacobson at this uh, time. Uh, Juliet is a attending physician within the Division of Palliative Care and Geriatric Medicine. She also directs the Continuum Project, we, which we established a few years ago to uh, educate our staff and patients about palliative care and about how to have uh, important discussions about serious uh, illness. And obviously that capability has, has always been important, but never more important than in, over the last few months. So uh, Juliet, uh, I look forward to your uh, remarks and look forward to participating in the Q&A that will follow them. Thank you all so much. Wonderful, thank, thank you, Peter. Um, so I've been at Mass General since 2006. I did a palliative care fellowship here and I stayed here. And as um, Dr. Slavin said, my role is actually to train other clinicians to have these conversations with patients and families about their goals and their values and their priorities if they were to get sicker. And we call these conversations matters most conversations or serious illness conversations. And so that was what I was doing. And then as the pandemic unfolded, I was part of um, a senior group of palliative care clinicians who actually went into the emergency room to have these conversations with some of our sickest patients um, to think about what their priorities were right then for their healthcare. Um, and the way, the way we did this, the ER would, would call us and I would call the PCP or the oncologist just to try to get a little bit of a sense of what might be happening with the patient's health. And then I would go in the room 
my mask and my goggles and my gloves and my hat um, to talk with patients about um, what their most important priorities would be. I learned quickly to bring my phone, it's my, my best friend, um, and I learned quickly to use FaceTime so I could see patients' families as we had these conversations because it often wasn't enough for, for me to have this conversation just with the patient. We needed to have their family involved. One time I thought I was calling a son and I got eight family members and the, the grandkids poking out in the back. Um, it was heartbreaking to see how worried they were for, um, for their family member. So I'm gonna tell you a story about a patient that I met down um, in the emergency room when I was doing some of this work. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna call her Josephine. She was uh, in her mid eighties and healthy. She was living alone. She had a few medical problems, but um, was, was getting along. And uh, she was new to Mass General. In fact, when I met her, she said, oh, I, wa I wanted to go to Tufts, but the ambulance brought me here. So it's fair to say, as my 13 year old would say, she's a little salty but I, I kind of like that about her. And um, we, we were worried about her. She had come in with some difficulty breathing and she um, was requiring oxygen. And she had uh, a sister who had, had COVID-19. Her sister was doing fine at home, but she was at high risk um, to get sick. And so I was asked to talk to her. And um, what we know about these conversations, these serious illness conversations, the kind of conversation I was about to have with Josephine is mostly that we don't do them enough. And we know in Massachusetts, for our sickest patients, the people who we think maybe just have a few years to live, who are unable to um, really do the things that they wanna do anymore, for those patients, we know that only a third of them have talked with their clinicians about what their goals and priorities might be for their healthcare. And we know that this is really a missed opportunity when patients have the opportunity to have these conversations, they report better quality of life, they are more likely to get the care that they want, and they often feel better. They have less anxiety and less depression. And it, it makes sense. I sometimes think of these conversations as the elephant in the room, and they're hard to do, but when you finally talk about some of these things, people often feel better. And so, because we know these are important, we've actually been working hard for a number of years to try to have more conversations. And we adopted a program, it's called the Serious Illness Care Program, that came out of Ariadne Labs. So this is Atul Gawande's lab. And Atul was really looking at systems change and systems change in the surgical field. And as, as many of you probably know, he had a personal experience and he was taking care of sick patients. And what he thought was, is there a way to take some of this systems knowledge I have and, and think about it in this end of life domain? And that's how we got the Serious Illness Care Program. And being a systems program, it has multiple parts. So one important part is training. And um, it, it might surprise you, but most clinicians were not trained to have these conversations. And when I was in medical school, even when I was in palliative care fellowship, we weren't trained well to really talk with patients about their values and their goals. It's, it's an abstract conversation and it's just not what um, doctors are trained to do. And so what Atul did is he had this idea um, of a checklist, which he then used for communication. I'm gonna show it to you, it looks like this. And um, the novelty of this is that he trains clinicians by actually having people follow a script. So you don't have to have the whole conversation in your head the whole time. You can use the scaffold. And they've tested this approach with patients and families. And patients and families find it very acceptable because clinicians start with a question and then they might follow up and talk with you more. But then they go back to the next question. It kind of keeps us on track a little bit um, for these hard conversations. So that's the first part of the, the program. The second part of the Serious Illness Care Program is, is having a place to put these conversations. And what was happening before is, is people might have a conversation and it would go in the bottom of a note somewhere and there's hundreds of notes in the medical record and a patient shows up to the emergency room and it's really hard to find, you know, what is the prognosis? What does the patient wanna know? What are their values for their care? It's really hard to find that information. And so what we've done is we've centralized that information with one click an emergency room clinician can understand the conversations that you've had with your clinicians. And you may have had more than one, and we have a way that we file them so that the clinicians can see all of those quickly. 
So the third thing we've done with the program is we wanted to make sure people weren't left behind. It, it's not enough just for some PCPs to have conversations and others not. We wanted to make sure that all the patients that had potentially unmet palliative care needs had the opportunity to have these conversations. So we've tried to figure out who those people are. So this was all going on prior to the pandemic. We trained 1,300 clinicians. These are interprofessional clinicians from chaplains to social workers to physicians. We believe that lots of different people have lots of different variations of these conversations with patients over, over years. And those clinicians had documented 8,000 conversations in the medical record. And we'd figured out at least 3,000 additional patients who needed a conversation. And, and then the pandemic started um, and we realized also that these conversations were perhaps even more important than we thought that they were. And there were, there were two things that happened in regard to that. The first thing is that patients changed. And I will admit, even as a palliative care clinician, sometimes I might collude a little bit with my patients who don't want to have a hard conversation on a good day. We might put that off. Um, it sometimes can feel like it's, it's never the right time until it's too late. Um, but that changed and we had patients calling our phones and leaving messages, asking to talk to clinicians and um, explaining what they wanted for their medical care. So the, so the patients changed. And I would say the other thing that happened is clinicians changed. And what we had once seen as reluctance to have these conversations um, just melted away as more and more patients came in through our emergency room. You know, we were taking care of patients um, in a critical care capacity that had doubled. So we doubled the number of critical care beds we had. We were using some operating room ventilators, kind of repurposing them for critical care. And we realized that these resources were very important. And it felt very important that we make sure that we were treating patients who wanted this level of care, that it wasn't just that we didn't have the conversation, that we really had the conversation to make sure our patients were getting the care that they wanted. So that's how I ended up in the emergency room with Josephine. Uh, and so I went into the room and I said to Josephine what I said to, have said to lots of people, um, which is that the vast majority of patients who have COVID-19 have, have mild disease. And I could see that Josephine was stable and I was hoping with her that her disease would be mild and we could hope for that together. And we also know that a small percentage of patients um, are admitted to the hospital and that a few patients get very sick. And so what I also wanted to do with her was to think a little bit about the what ifs and what might our plan be if she were very sick. And Josephine being salty, she wasn't, she wasn't so sure about this conversation, but she let me go on. And um, so I asked her one of the questions that I found to be very helpful at, in this time, which is this question of um, how much are, are you willing to go through for the possibility of more time? And we know with the coronavirus that um, the patients that get very sick need to be intubated. And so one of the questions is, is, is that something that you want to go through? And um, we also know that sometimes people are sick for a long time. And so what we were asking people to do is just give us some sense of their own reserve of what they felt like they were willing to try, even if they didn't know 100%, just to help us um, get some sense of that. And um, Josephine, she said she didn't really want to talk about it. She said, I'll, I'll take it as it comes. I'll take it as it comes. And so I, I tried in a different way. And I said, um, one of the things that's helpful for us to know is are there abilities for you that are so critical that you can't imagine living without them? And I had had another patient in the emergency room. I asked this question a lot. And she said, driving. I drive everywhere. I drive to my family, my daughters every day. I, I, I can't imagine living without driving. And driving is interesting because what we know is, is people adapt. And I suspected that that patient would adapt to not being able to drive. But there are some abilities that some people feel like they can adapt to or they don't want to adapt to. And some of those are if, if they're not themselves, if they can't talk to family or relate and um, 
be the person that they are, then, it, then, then more care wouldn't really make sense. And for some people, even being in a nursing home sometimes feels like too big of a change if they've had a very independent life. So thinking about some of these things helps us guide patients through very difficult care decisions. And that was what I was trying to learn a little bit from Josephine. And um, Josephine was funny. She didn't want to talk about it at all. She told me, she said, my sister had this illness and my sister came to Mass General and my sister didn't have to answer these questions. And so I don't want to answer these questions. And um, I tried to leave as gracefully as I could. But as, as the afternoon wore on, I, I did get the sense that um, Josephine appreciated the effort. You know, in the emergency room, there's not a lot to do when patients are in these rooms and there's kind of glass doors. And so they kind of watch us walking by all afternoon. And it, at some point, Josephine gave me a kind of a nod and a wave, um, which, which I took to be that it was okay that we tried to have that conversation. So I had I told you that many patients wanted to have these conversations um, as the pandemic unfolded, and that's true. And there were many people like Josephine, where it felt like it's it's too hard. And that's very consistent with the literature that that we have about how people, how all of us respond to existential threat. They've done some interesting studies where they've created a, a threat-like environment where you, you see a picture of yourself and symbols of death. And they, they put people in MRI machines and see kind of what the brain does with that information. And what we've learned is that we categorize that event as something that happens to someone else. We don't want to store that threat of our own death as something that happens to us, which makes sense. We're often trying not to think about these hard things. And what these researchers speculated was that hundreds of years ago, when we were simply more surrounded by more death, that children died early, people died in the home, that our, our way of storing that information was balanced by what we saw in our lives. And so we were able to take in that truth a little bit more easily. And what's happened with, with modern living is, is thankfully we're, we're protected a little bit more from that, but it can make it harder than to take in that that might happen to you. And I think that is what was happening with Josephine a little bit. What, um, what we do in, in palliative care, this idea is so important of kind of how to think about patients that, that don't wanna talk about this, is that we have a model for it. We, we say it's a little bit like a pendulum and that patients have times when they're hopeful and they want to um, stay positive and not think about things and then they have times when they are able to take in the reality of a situation. And I'll tell you that's, that's true for me. That's, I think that's probably true for lots of people now um, in this pandemic. I have times when I'm, this is a summer collection, I'm buying masks and I'm planning and I'm thinking about how to keep myself safe or I'm sad and I'm, I'm processing some of the feelings um, that all of this has brought on for me. And then I have other times, I'll tell you most mornings I wake up and I, I think, could it have been a dream, right? I still, I still do that. Um, or I have times when I think maybe it'll just all melt away in the summertime. And I go back and forth. And this, this back and forth is a way that we all use to take in something hard, um, but not all the time. So we give ourselves a break when we're hopeful, and then we try and think about it again. And we go back and forth. And so that's what Josephine um, was doing, I think, in the emergency room. I, I caught her at a, at a more hopeful time. The times when we get into trouble, and this is true for clinicians, I think it's true for, for family members too, is when we see those hopeful times and we think that means someone never wants to talk about it, that they're in denial or that it's too hard. And what I train our clinicians here at Mass General to do is um, just, um, kind of coexist with the hopefulness and then look for the times when someone's more realistic and that can often be the right time to have a deeper conversation. So if you're feeling like that, if you're feeling like it might be something that you would want to do, people have these conversations with family, they have them with their clinicians, and some of the questions that you might be thinking about if you're preparing to have a conversation would be questions like, how much do you wanna know about your illness? 
what, what kind of information would be helpful to you to know? And I will say there's, there's no right or wrong answers. People sometimes think, oh, I have to know the prognosis or I have to know detail. And you don't at all. We can help guide you through decision making with, with big picture conversations. It doesn't have to be specific. Some people find the specifics helpful and some people um, really don't. So there's, there's this question of time, like do you wanna know how much time you have? And then there's also a question of, of what that time might be like. What might you be able to do or not do um, as you become sicker? Are there things that you're most worried about that you would wanna talk with your clinician about? And then there's the questions I asked Josephine, the question of how much you're willing to go through for the possibility of more time. And also the question of what abilities feel so critical that you wouldn't want to live without them. And finally, there may be types of medical care that you already know that you don't want. Some patients will say, I would never want a feeding tube, or I would never want to be on a machine if I couldn't wake up. And so having a sense of that is also helpful. And you can ask your clinician to have these types of conversations. You could say, could we talk about the big picture? Or would it be OK if we had a serious illness conversation? Sometimes these conversations fit into a regular appointment. Sometimes people may schedule a separate appointment to have them. Sometimes they want to bring their family, and that's wonderful because everybody can hear all the information. And other times it doesn't feel right at all, and people just want to process it with themselves and their clinician. So there's, there's no one way to do this. There's all sorts of ways to do it. And I don't want to imply that this is easy at all. Um, I, I, on my to-dos is to try and have this conversation with my father. I haven't quite done it yet. It feels hard and sad. Um, he's well, and I tell myself that's a good reason not to do it, but um, I think these things are difficult. So I'm gonna tell you the end of Josephine's story, and um, I'm gonna warn you that it's sad. So um, what happened is I left the emergency room. Josephine was um, sitting there, she was, she was doing fine. And about an hour later, I got a call that um, she'd had a cardiac arrest and that she was um, on a breathing machine in the emergency room. And I learned uh, later that she died um, a few hours after that. And um, I felt shocked to hear that, um, even though this is my job, it, it still felt um, unexpected and hard, and it wasn't what I expected for her. Uh, and when I had seen her, she was, she was well, she was doing stable. We, we weren't even sure if she had the coronavirus. Um, and what we learned later is, is, that, is that she did, and that she probably had a, a blood clot that went to her lungs. And I asked myself, um, did we do right by her? You know, did we give her good care in our emergency room? Um, and I, I believe that we did. Um, the goal for these conversations isn't that someone choose one treatment or another treatment or decide to be on machines or not. I think the goal for us is that people have the opportunity to think about what they want and, and talk to someone about what they want. And I think we did offer that to Josephine. And she told us she wanted to take things as they came, which is, which is what we did. Uh, but there is also a part of me that wonders if she had had a conversation two weeks ago or two months ago, or maybe even two years ago, would she have been able to understand her own health a little bit more differently and perhaps make a different decision for herself and, and for her family. So I wanna close by just really emphasizing that the, the reason we have these conversations, it's not, it's not really so that we can have a plan for end of life, although that's important and that is part of what these conversations are about. The, the real reason we talk with all of our patients and we find our patients to have these conversations is to think about how to live with the time that does remain. And when I sit down with someone and I try to help them understand their health and what might come and try to really think through what's important to them, what I'm really trying to say is time is precious, maybe more precious than you realized. And I wanna give you the opportunity to really think about how, how you wanna spend your time. 
And Viktor Frankl gives us some wisdom, and he's been somebody that I've been rereading at this time, so I'll just close with something that he said. Um, he says, life's not primarily a quest for pleasure or a quest for power, but a quest for meaning. And the greatest task for any person is to find meaning in his or her life. All right. Julia, thanks very much. Um, we'll uh, now move to sort of the questions. Uh, yeah. One question that's come through, it says, how do you suggest having these difficult discussions with patients when young children are involved in the conversation? I think that's a really important question. And um, I would say that this is usually not one conversation. I would say this is often a series of conversations. When we look at our data, a third of our patients have more than one conversation. And that perhaps the first conversation is really with the patient and maybe loved ones who might be helping to make medical decisions. And then when some of the emotion is processed, then a, a plan can be made to think about how to talk with children about what's happening here at Mass General, we have a very special program. It's called the Parenting in the Challenging Time Program. And, and their whole job is to help parents talk to their children about, about serious illness and what might come in the future. So I would say that's definitely a role for expertise and there's definitely guidance here at Mass General for that. Um, is there a specific question or a topic that you think is often forgotten when having these uh, end of life discussions? I think the mistake we make sometimes is um, to not spend enough time thinking about what we are gonna do and what we can do and um, what, what, what is the most meaningful with, with our time. I think we spend so much time in the sad place that we almost forget to go to a hopeful space a hopeful place with all of this. And it, it, it can feel contradictory, but I think that's actually what keeps us going is thinking about um, the meaning that does come from, from these conversations and from the choices we make as a result of these conversations. Uh, Peter, you mentioned the uh, rapid adoption of uh, you know, telemedicine uh, as of what you think is gonna be a, a carryover or a, a permanent change. Are there other changes that you see carrying over as a result of this pandemic? Um, yes, I think uh, I think so. I mean, we, we've been able to use the hospital much more flexibly than we have in the in the past. Um, been able to repurpose units um, at speeds that I don't think anybody previously thought possible. We also have. Um, we redeployed a bunch of people, so had teams of medical docs, anesthesiologists, radiologists working together in the care of uh, patients with COVID, and I think those uh, experiences were very positive for, for our staff. So I, I think just in increasing the flexibility of the use of our resources, both physical and personnel, is, a, is an important lesson uh, go, going forward. I think another one is that one I mentioned earlier, just the incredibly vivid connection between the social determinants of health and, um, and, and patients winding up in our ICU, for example. Um, we, we, I think for anybody who doubted that we are more than a healthcare organization, we are a health organization. I, I, I hope this experience dispels those doubts and that we will be working even more vigorously with the communities that count on us uh, going going forward. I, I think the other thing that was, uh, I hope we'll do more of is, I mean, there, there was not only great collaboration across the Mass, Mass General, but across our entire health system, now known as Mass General Brigham. Uh, we did things uh, together across Mass General Brigham, like stand up this decontamination facility in Somerville, that I'm not sure that a single hospital could have pulled off. So I think this um, this demonstrated to I think lots of people across the health system that working together in a collaborative way could help make all parts of our health system uh, even better. So, Britt, those are just a few 
uh, of, of the thing, lessons that we've learned and that I hope we will carry forward into the future. Uh, uh, in Dr. Jacobson's comments, which I feel were very poignant and showed tremendous compassion, um, she didn't mention the role of one's faith. Uh, would you comment about this topic? Yeah, it, it's, um, it's, it's really what gives people strength and meaning in facing all of this. Um, one of the questions on the serious illness guide is actually about what gives people strength. And it, the aim is, is to think deeply about that question. Um, it, it gets back to the other question about um, the things that we sometimes miss. And that's um, also what our, our internal reserves are to manage hard times and really being able to draw upon those. And, and Britt, I would just add on this subject that our chaplains have been working overtime to meet the spiritual needs of our patients in the hospital. In fact, I know we had to call in chaplains from outside of the hospital because our, our staff couldn't keep up with the demand. So just building on what Juliet said, this, this has been an important, the chaplains are a very vital part of our care team and, uh, and I think help nourish the souls of, uh, of our patients who uh, are, are religious and, and find comfort in, in their religion. They were an amazing presence in the emergency room too during all of this. Gave a lot of people strength. Uh, Dr. Slaven, um, we were amazed when you were describing the uh, way the hospital uh, responded to this in all the planning. I'm curious, when did the hospital first become aware and when did you start planning to be so prepared? Uh, the hospital actually started preparing in January. I think it was in the third or fourth week in January when some unusual things were happening in China that we became aware of that we turned on our incident command system. And I think, and, and so they, that group began strategizing about how we might respond if this illness uh, reached the shores of the United States and became a major problem uh, for our patients and, and communities. I think it was in early March, I believe it was March 6th, where we actually took over the trustees room at the hospital and made that our incident command center, which it's been uh, ever, ever since then. But the planning really began in January. And again, I credit our emergency preparedness program for having, for, for having the foresight to, uh, to identify this threat uh, at a very early stage. Okay. Um. Dr. Jacobson, how do you handle these discussions when the end of life is more imminent and when there's no longer a longer time frame to discuss? Yeah, one of my, um, one of my most memorable conversations, it's actually, we're publishing it in a, in a week or two, um, was with a, a man who, in the emergency room who um, was intubated about, about 20 minutes after I talked with him and his wife on the phone. Um, to, to understand some of what was important to him. At, at that time, when there's very little time to talk, what felt most important for me um, was preparing his wife for some of the decision-making that she might have to engage with. Um, and it was about um, talking with him about if he did get sicker, would it, would it be okay to let go? And for him to be able to say that. Um, at the same time trying, you know, we, we, we intubated him to try to get him better, but also having a very focused conversation about those questions so that she could be prepared for decision making um, and, and wouldn't kind of have to hold the burden of decision making all herself. He was actually able to say that it would be okay. Dr. Slayton, we've seen uh, uh reports on uh, TV and in the newspapers about staggering losses that the uh, hospitals are uh, experiencing right now. Uh, what steps is the Mass General uh, taking to address this? Um, well, the most staggering losses are the loss of our patients. Um, and I, and I, just, I wanted to comment on that. Um, we've admitted over a thousand patients with COVID-19 since there's this outbreak began, um, but I'm very pleased to say that of all the patients that have been discharged from the hospital so far, 
uh, only 12% of them have uh, passed, passed away. 88% of them have gone home or gone to some other uh, facility. So um, a 12% mortality rate uh, when other hospitals in Italy, China reported 80% uh, mortality rates is um, we're, we're quite pleased with. But again, it's this most important loss has been the loss of those uh, 12, 12%. As far as the finances of the hospital go, this has been very, um, sig has had a very significant effect. Our revenue over the last few months is down about 50%, and our expenses really haven't changed uh, much, much at all. We took some early steps to freeze capital spending, to freeze hiring, um, to freeze the use of consultants, uh, to try to uh, minimize the impact, but uh, but despite that, we are losing about $4 million a day and are clearly going to have to take some more steps in the future to uh, to uh, stop the, the hemorrhaging. We're, we're fortunate that as a hospital and a health system, we're starting off in a reasonable place financially, so we're not at any risk of running out of, uh, running out of cash, but uh, this will have a, a very significant impact on our cash position and um, our ability to, to move forward in, in the future. So I think in many ways, organizationally, from the lessons we learn, give us um, the potential to do more in the future. But I think our financial, the financial resources we'll have available to us in the future will, will be a force in, in the other direction. So once, once again, if philanthropy is going to play an incredibly important role in helping us sort of uh, resume operations and maintain generate the momentum we, we need uh, going forward to have the biggest possible impact we can have on the people who, who count on us. I think this next question uh, is actually for both of you. And Juliet, I'll ask you to start off with the answer. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the hospital staff and how they're doing right now after a couple of months of responding to the pandemic and if and how the staff have been redeployed to uh, uh, new areas. So Julia, if you could just talk about how they're responding and Peter, if you could talk about the redeployment. So, Yeah, I, I've, I've been working clinically this week. Um, I think um, people are tired um, and groups are organizing to be able to take breaks, which is very important. There's a, a lot to process that um, doesn't happen by itself and it, it doesn't necessarily happen when you're at work and, and busy. And so I think people are, are beginning to feel that. I would say um, people also feel proud um, of, of, of what we've done, of, of how everyone came together um, and how brave everybody was and how helpful people were to each other. Um, I was doing these outreach calls and I had a group of surgeons call me and say, can we help? And so. 15 of them learned how to have serious illness conversations and called patients um, to try and, and help with, with the effort. It was, it was remarkable. Yeah, Britt, um, I, I would just add that um, at the peak, we, we redeployed thousands of our staff to various parts of the hospital, to Chelsea, mm -hmm. to Boston Hope, a variety of different uh, locations. Fortunately, as the numbers come down, the staff are beginning to return to uh, to their home base or the parts of the hospital where they previously worked. At the height of this uh, pandemic, we were only operating 10 op operating rooms. We normally operate over 50, but, um, but we wanted to make sure that we weren't, well, that we, we cut back on all sorts of elective things like elective surgery so that we had the capacity to care for uh, COVID-19 patients. Uh, now we have, we're operating 15 rooms in the uh, in the operating room, and as of next week, we'll be back up to 30 uh, as the staff gets redeployed and as state government allows us to uh, expand the the types of patients that we can legally uh, provide care to. Um, I, I would agree with Juliet that I, th I think there are many emotions running through the minds of our staff. I think pride is definitely one of them. I think. Um, uh, the honor of being involved in trying to address one of our, our lives' great, greatest uh, challenge. 
Uh, I think fatigue at this point is definitely one of them. And there's no doubt that throughout this entire period, fear has been another part of this, uh, the, the psychology. Um, I mean, our staff after the marathon bombing, after the Rhode Island nightclub fire, um, face similar heartache and, and clinical challenges, but they never had to fear for their own lives. And so I think that underlying fear, catching COVID-19, uh, passing it on to family members is, uh, is something that everyone is living with. Uh, some, you, you can see it at the very, it's right at the surface. Others, I think, are able to suppress those uh, emotions uh, more, but I, I have no doubt that that's uh, there. And I think all of our staff has just seen much more in the way of uh, pain and suffering than they normally see, and, and that's been difficult. I, I think there will undoubtedly be long-term tra psychological trauma to our staff that we see, we're, we're used to in members of the military coming off of active service, and, uh, and we are actually talking about using our home base program, which has met the needs of uh, our military, and also our, the Benson Henry Mind Body Medicine uh, Institute to help to develop programs that can will be there to support our staff uh, in in the long term. Uh, Dr. Jacobson, is it unusual for palliative care physicians to be deployed or to visit patients in an emergency room? It it it's it's something we've learned from this was that we can be very helpful. Not all of the patients we saw had COVID-19. Um, in fact, many of them, we didn't, we didn't know if, if they were going to have that. Um, and yet it felt like these conversations mattered and these conversations helped patients throughout their whole hospitalization be able to be more articulate about what they wanted for their healthcare. So it's actually a model that we're gonna continue that we learned um, about from this experience. Uh, uh, Peter, as the pandemic starts to slow and people are coming back to the hospital for elective surgeries, uh, one, uh, what can you say to reassure patients that it's safe to come to the hospital? And is there anything patients should be doing differently to prepare uh, other than wearing masks? No, it, we will be sure that it is uh, safe. Uh, and I think our staff has seen that with the appropriate PPE, social distancing, all the things you read about in the uh, press, um, that, that it, it can be safe. The, these tools do pre help prevent uh, the spread of this virus very, very significantly. So uh, we, are, we, we will ensure that our patients are cared for safely, are appropriately distanced from one another, uh, or have, are wearing masks as, as our staff will be. Uh, we'll be doing lots of extra cleaning. Um, so so we, we will take whatever steps are necessary to ensure that our patients uh, are cared for in a, in a safe, safe environment. Um, we, I mean, one of the things that we've been worried about in over the recent weeks has been not the patients that we're seeing, but the patients that we're, we're not seeing. We, we realize that not only is our staff afraid of this uh, virus, but everyone is afraid. And a lot of people seemingly have not been getting the care they need because of that fear, care for cardiac disease, care for strokes, et cetera. We've seen our cardiac visits in the emergency room go down by 50%. We've seen the number of visits for stroke go down by about a third. And so we're really worried that people are riding out very serious symptoms at home because of the fear of COVID, contracting COVID-19 when that, that risk is, is very, very small and, yet, and the risk of having a heart attack at home or a stroke at, at home is, is very, very serious. So we, we need to make sure that people try, put that fear in some appropriate context. And uh, Dr. Jacobson, you started out your comments describing the Continuum Project. Uh, and um, I think the question is, uh, do you think as a result of this uh, pandemic, more physicians will be actively engaged in having these serious illness conversations going forward. I, I think it's changed how all of us understand the importance of these conversations. I had so many conversations with primary care clinicians who I, I, I would call from the emergency room and say, your, your patient's here and they're sick. 
you know, what have, what have you talked about? Um, and I think it really brought it home that, that, that this was important to, to make time for this and, and to have these conversations. I, I think we won't be the same after this. Well, um, not surprisingly, we still have a number of questions to uh, uh, answer, but we've reached sort of the end of the hour. Uh, uh, once again, I want to thank uh, uh, Peter. I want to thank Juliet for really you know, terrific comments and a really inspiring uh, uh, sort of question and answer session. Uh, and most importantly, I just want to thank all of the members of the 1811 Society, uh, those that have uh, contributed to the Emergency Response Fund. Uh, it really is humbling the way that you entrust us uh, to use your gifts wisely, and um, we wouldn't be able to respond in the way that we do were it not for your support. Uh, so uh, good night and be safe.